Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel. Thank you for joining me today. We'll be exploring Kirkbride, American Asylums, finishing the reset in the 1800s. In yesterday's video, we looked at photos set during the 1850s, and we postulated a theory about the reset occurring around 1850. But how did they get that reset to continue? How did they make it successful? Going back to the five eras theory, again, considering the top timeline potentially being the most accurate, although, again, in full disclosure, I don't know. There could be years that we're not aware of. How long did the reset actually take? Did it last a year? Did it last five years, ten years, a hundred years? It's all open for debate. We just don't know. I don't know. This presentation is based on theory and conjecture attempting to provide some explanations for many clues that we see in photos, historical narratives, the conflicts and the anomalies that we observe in both. I believe that the Kirkbride plan and the use of asylums in the United States provides a very important clue for what very likely transpired after the last reset and how those who are in control and make genuine policy decisions had a plan to ensure that the reset would be successful. So let's see what the mainstream tells us about the Kirkbride plan. The Kirkbride plan was a system of mental asylum design advocated by American psychiatrist Thomas Story Kirkbride in the mid 19th century. The asylums built in the Kirkbride design, often referred to as Kirkbride buildings or simply Kirkbrides, were constructed during the mid to late 19th century in the United States. So right in that questionable time frame. The structural features of the hospitals as designated by Kirkbride were contingent on his theories regarding the healing of the mentally ill in which environment and exposure to natural light and air circulation were crucial. So this sounds very benign and it sounds very altruistic. The hospitals built according to the Kirkbride plan would adopt various architectural styles but had in common the bat wing style floor plan, housing numerous wings that sprawl outward from the center. The first hospital designed under the Kirkbride plan was the Trenton State Hospital in Trenton, New Jersey, constructed in 1948. Throughout the remainder of the 19th century, numerous psychiatric hospitals were designed under the Kirkbride plan across the United States. By the 20th century, popularity of the design had waned, largely due to the economic pressures of maintaining the immense facilities, as well as contestation of Kirkbride's theories amongst the medical community. So wait a minute. There were economic pressures in maintaining the immense facilities, but apparently there were no economic pressures in constructing them. Fascinating. Again, another marvel of the 19th century. Numerous Kirkbride structures still exist. Of course they do. Though many have been demolished or partially demolished and repurposed. Yes, of course, on that account too. At least 30 of the original Kirkbride buildings have been registered with the National Register of Historic Places in the United States, either directly or through their location on hospital campuses or in historic districts. So let's look at the basis in philosophy, as that's one of the key clues that we have with the establishment of state mental hospitals in the U.S. is partly due to reformer Dorothea Dix, who testified to the New Jersey legislature in 1844, vividly describing the state's treatment of lunatics. They were being housed in county jails, private homes, and the basements of public buildings. Dix's effort led to the construction of the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum, the first complete asylum built on the Kirkbride plan. Thomas Story Kirkbride, 1809-1883, a psychiatrist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, developed his requirements of asylum design based on a philosophy of moral treatment and environmental determinism. The typical floor plan, with long rambling wings arranged in echelon, staggered so each connected wing receives sunlight and fresh air, was meant to promote privacy and comfort for patients. The building form itself was meant to have a curative effect. Special apparatus for the care of lunacy, whose grounds should be highly improved and tastefully ornamented. The idea of institutionalization was thus central to Kirkbride's plan for effectively treating the insane. So you get an idea of what the summary is, and of course it all sounds very benign. And there's a picture of Mr. Kirkbride right there, or should I say a drawing, as Johnny Depp would say, of Thomas Story Kirkbride, the creator of the Kirkbride plan. But the fundamentals of it are that we have this standard template of designs for buildings, one featured right here, 
and laying out the buildings this way is going to help us treat the mentally ill. Okay. On the surface, this all sounds very benign and this sounds very altruistic. We legitimately want to help people. Although we have interesting conflicting accounts of what the state of morality in the 19th century really was, this sounds like it's a good idea. This sounds like it's something there to benefit the people. Well, let's look into it a little further. How exactly was one considered insane or committed to an asylum in the 19th century? Let's take a look. All right, so let's take a look at reasons for admission to asylums, 1864 to 1889. Intemperance and business trouble, very serious. Kicked in the head by a horse, oh, serious problem then. Hereditary predisposition. Ill treatment by husband. Hysteria. Marriage of son, well that's always a good one to send somebody right off the edge, we've made movies about that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Medicine to prevent conception. <sighs> Novel reading. Overaction of the mind. <laughs> Periodical fits. Political excitement. Politics in general. <laughs> well, as you read through this, you know, you get all these amazing little details, and basically, you get the feeling that they could just confine you to an asylum for really any reason. Let's look at some more. Egotism. The war. Time of life. Does that mean that you're, you've are you been around too long, you're too old, or you've experienced some rough events? Hard to say. Vicious vices. Hmm. Women trouble. That's right. Don't have any issues with your relationships. That'll get you confined. Superstition. Snuff eating for two years, as opposed to snuff eating for one year. Spinal irritation. Gathering in the head. Hard study, rumor of husband murder, as opposed to actual husband murder. Okay, so I guess if your husband's really murdered, then it's okay to be hysterical over it, although I'm sure they could find other reasons. Salvation Army. <sighs> Dissipation of the nerves. Fell from horse in war. You know, you have to wonder, do they have a catch-all in this? Sort of like the very aptly named Uniform Code of Military Justice in the United States military. That's the catch-all where if they can't find something else that they can charge you with, that they can get you on. And in the United States military, that is called conduct unbecoming an officer, conduct unbecoming a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine. Basically, if you go against the grain or somebody doesn't like you, there's something they can charge you with. And I think I found it here. I believe it's this one right here. Bad company. So if somebody considers you bad company, that is, they don't like you, they could have you confined to a mental asylum in the 19th century. Now, a lot of people will say that this all-inclusive list was partially a joke, but it is rooted in realism. And we don't really understand what the full process was for having people confined to asylums. Now, you'll see in some of the more mainstream channels on YouTube, they do a very objective review of asylums to their credit. And they talk about a lot of the controversy. And one of the stories you'll hear of is of an unfortunate woman whose husband had her confined to an asylum because he simply wanted her out of the way. But you can find stories of many different people in all different facets of life and all different social classes at that who were just suddenly confined to asylums. There are too many stories to go around. And when you look at this all-inclusive list, which also has the catch-all reason, it seems obvious that anybody could be confined to an asylum for any reason in this time frame. Very suspicious indeed. Well, let's take a look at what these buildings looked like. So let's begin by looking at the first so-called Kirkbride Asylum, the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum. And yes, you see their bat wing layout as they call it, and you have all these rooms in separate wings where they could all get sun, at least that's what they were told, and I suppose pragmatically these rooms would get sun, and then of course they all come off a central facility. And then of course you see the adjoining image right here. Hmm. I wonder if this dome was mandatory or was this just something that was optional on these facilities if they did indeed build them. And I know a recurring question that comes up is, okay, well, if these buildings were already here and they were inherited, what was their original function? 
Well, that's something we really don't know because we don't have any idea of what the society or the civilization before us was truly like. We can speculate. And a lot of speculations I've heard and some really good theories, and I think a lot of them come from John Levi, I've heard him say them a lot, is that potentially these were large hotels or resorts. And you can see why it matches that kind of layout where you have all these rooms off a main hallway and then you have a main meeting area. You know, these are where your meeting rooms are. Or perhaps there was some other function. Maybe it was some sort of government building where people came from across the land to meet in more isolated areas where they could get away from everything and they would stay in these rooms and then they would meet in the central meeting rooms and that's where they would discuss local politics. Who knows? It's speculation, but nevertheless, it is clear these buildings are laid out the same in some facets, although there are subtle differences. And let's take a look at some more. So this is the Institute of the Pennsylvania Hospital, and supposedly this is the one that Kirkbride made into his first full prototype after the New Jersey one, of course, in 1859. So they say that it was in existence in 1841, and then they expanded it, and Kirkbride, utilizing his brilliant theories, made this wonderful building. And of course, you know, optional dome is installed. Amazing building, though. A couple little pillars, and then, you know, the central hall facility area. And then the other interesting thing is, why have multiple floors if you're dealing with people that are confined to an asylum? I mean, I don't know. To me, that always seemed a little counterproductive. Would it make more sense if this was a hotel or an administration building? Yes. Does it make less sense to me if it's an asylum to try to help people that are unstable? It makes a lot less sense in that case. I also included this uh, interior photo so you can just see how amazing this building was on the inside. And look at this architecture here. Again, you have amazing arches and just beauty and serenity. And of course, that goes in line with the stated purpose of it. Well, we need to make these buildings really nice for these people that we send there. But remember, they need to get lots of sunlight. It's good for them. But if the building had a different purpose, perhaps that makes more sense as to why it's beautiful and why it gets a lot of sunlight. Just some things to think about. Could be off base. This is the facility in Oregon, and this is supposedly one of the oldest facilities on the West Coast, founded <laughs> in 1862, although they do admit that this building was supposedly built in 1883. Just to note that Oregon became a state in 1859, and they already had a facility of some sort, it was probably likely this building, in existence in 1862 because, you know, even though it would just become a state and people were still settling it, you needed to make sure that you had your asylum. You couldn't go without an asylum anywhere. And we'll just wait till you see where the story's going. Taunton State Hospital in Massachusetts, 1854. Now this is the old admin building and this is no longer standing. This is allegedly a photo from the 1980s, although who knows for sure amazing beautiful dome on it and look at the look at the big window there it's just remarkable i mean all this effort and all this detail for a mental asylum in 1854 or whenever they would say they actually built it and what do we have here looks like this could be some sort of power source potentially or were they just putting a really nice tall device on the top of it for decorative purposes you know maybe that was to help people as they were walking around outside hey look at the tall tower it's really pretty it relaxes me hmm you, you do have to wonder when you look at all these buildings i don't know i mean it is beautiful I'm not going to deny that St. Elizabeth Hospital opened in 1855 under the name Government Hospital for the Insane. And this is supposedly in the Washington, D.C. area, I believe. And this has more of a castle layout to the top of it. Although you do see the familiar layout with the central facility and then, of course, the wings going off from it that do have the exposure to sunlight. But again, that just seems to be a little bit too convenient in terms of the purpose being to allow the patients to recover because, well, let's just say there's a lot of derogatory information and accounts that are associated with mental asylums and not just in the United States. And as I mentioned that, you might be asking, well, why is the focus on the United States? Why was the Kirkbride plan in the United States? Because it seems clear that the plan for how they were going to divide the land with dividing and designating the nations involves setting up the United States as eventually being the one and only hyper-military power in the world. Yes, it seems as though that was set up even back in this time, where you had people that settled from all different lands, they were bought in the United States, 
But the narrative that they were trying to spin at that time involved people coming there and having to accept the fact that they would see these large, amazing, beautiful buildings where there shouldn't be any in a story that they were told in a land that was not settled and not developed in any way, shape or form. And yet just seeing these photos, you get a different story. So you have to wonder if that all fell into the original purpose for the Kirkbride plan, conditioning the population to think what they are supposed to think. Kalamazoo Regional Psychiatric Hospital officially opened on 29 August 1859. This is in Michigan. And here we have more of a brick building. Nice tower. Not exactly sure what this is, if this is a different tower. You know, you got a bit of a mix of a castle with the old manor look, as I like to call it, from the 19th century. But again, a very beautiful building. Lots of detail with the brick and interesting designs on it. You know, who knows when it was originally built or what its original purpose was. Again, multiple floors. So looking at a couple different ones, and I've tried to select ones that I haven't seen on other channels or I haven't seen featured on anything with mental asylums, just to give you a fresh perspective. Bryce Hospital opened in 1861 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So look at this beautiful building. And of course we might say, well, this at least looks like it should be something in traditional Southern format, but interesting that they opened this up in 1861, right at the start of the Civil War. And Alabama, as we know, the official history tells us is one of the Confederate states. So did they just continue to operate this and continue abiding by the Kirkbride plan or did they care about the war and was it used for war purposes? Well, I really couldn't find anything on the history on it, but look at that. It does include the optional dome with the beautiful windows. So, you know, it's just like the same huge tower that I saw on the soldier's asylum in Milwaukee at the old soldier's home. You need to have this big tower where you can walk up to the top of and look out at the windows and get this amazing panoramic view because that's something else that will apparently help people who are mentally ill, right? Wait a minute. View at State Hospital Cherokee, Iowa? What? Look at this. Look at the tower on this. What a beautiful building this is. You, you, know, you have the fairy tale turrets and this is unbelievable. And, and the reason I say this is Cherokee, Iowa is isolated even to this day it's, I hate to say it, but it's not in a densely populated area. You could say it's in the middle of nowhere in BFI. <laughs> anyway, uh, I mean, just, just to show you exactly where it is. Okay, this is Western Iowa. The nearest cities are Sioux City, Sioux Falls, and Mankato. Mankato was featured a lot in Little House on the Prairie. But this is nowhere near Des Moines. This is nowhere near the large cities. I mean, this is a really isolated section of Iowa. There, there is not a dense population here. I mean, how far away did they have to get? We need to look more into this Cherokee hospital in Iowa. What's this look like? Is this still there today? So let's explore this facility, the Cherokee Mental Health Institute. And you can see where it's marked. And the closest major city is Sioux City, which is probably at least 40 miles away, if not more. I mean, it's just shocking. You're really here in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. Well, let's get a look and let's transition to our aerial imagery. Nice little town and oh yes, there it is. That same layout. Now, supposedly this one was built in 1902 and it was the last of the major asylums constructed in Iowa, but we'll get to that story when we do for right now. Let's take a look at this. I mean, wow. This thing is huge, and it's just in a small Iowa town in the middle of nowhere, and it just stands out. Let's see, can we drop the man? Looks like we can. Wow, it's still there. Incredible. In all its glory. What a facility. You know, and I'm reminded of early explorations of places like St. Coletta. I mean, just look at this construction. Unbelievable. They had the resources and the time to build something like this in the middle of isolated Iowa in 1902, before they had the state highway system well developed, well before the interstates, not too many decades after just establishing the Transcontinental Railroad. They just built this large facility out here. 
This just defies explanation. It looks like the uh, once beautiful tower that they had on it's been removed. That probably stood out a little bit too much as imposing questions when people saw that. How far does this really go anyway? Is there another building back here? Oh, yes, there is. Looks like it's obscured, but another brick building and another part of the compound. You know, it's just like St. Cleta. It just keeps going and going and going. You have to wonder how many people were really, I'll just go ahead and use the term, interred here. And another brick building. How much capacity did these things need? How many people did they have here? I mean, they tell us, you know, the, the largest ones took maybe a thousand, but you could see it was a capacity for so much more. It just defies explanation. All right, so I know what you're thinking. Aurelian, you just need to rein it in a little bit. You're probably going a little too far with this because, okay, so there were these amazing asylums that were built in the middle of nowhere. It goes along with that same old story. Yes, there may have been some people who were sent there against their will, we occasionally falsely convict someone and send them to prison wrongfully. It happens. We know about it. But why do we have such a negative connotation with asylums? Well, I'll pull up this little article that summarizes it pretty nicely. Yes, it's an urban legend, but urban legends don't just start on their own. There's always something behind them. The Central State Hospital. The building once known as Central State was originally built in 1873 as the home for juvenile delinquents at Lakeland. And just for context, we're in Louisville, Kentucky. The original buildings were adjacent to the woodlands that are now known as E.P. Tom Sawyer Park in Anchorage, Kentucky. So it's a very beautiful area. You can walk through there today. Due to the abundant overcrowding, and that's a recurring theme you'll get when it comes to asylums, especially in the 19th century. Abundant overcrowding. Why? At the Eastern and Western Asylums, the building at Lakeland was renamed and given a new purpose, the care and treatment of patients with psychological disorders. During the mid-1920s, allegations of abuse began to arise. Even the director, Dr. Prusis, sanity was put into question. In 1930, they began using cold showers, insulin, lobotomies, and electroshock therapy to cure patients. Reports of massive overcrowding began in the early 1940s, as wards originally designed to have a capacity of 1,600 were found to be holding well over 2,400. So again, I go back to that question, how many people were really interred in these facilities? In 1943, the state grand jury found the asylum committing people that were neither insane nor psychotic. Shocking. Very shocking. Many of the older buildings were labeled as fire traps due to their age and their deterioration. In 1953, Dr. A.M. Lyons was indicted for malfeasance and mismanagement. There were also reports of over 20 separate fires and murders among the wards and multiple escapes during his term as director. In the early 1960s, the state of Kentucky began funding of a $3 million plan to modernize the hospital in 1963. Three new buildings were open for use. During the 1970s, various changes went into effect. The hospital became privatized and patients that were not mentally ill were released. 1981 saw the biggest change in the hospital's history. It became an acute psychiatric hospital, and in 1986, all patients and administration moved into a more modern 192-bed facility. While the original buildings are gone now, the original hospital sadly was bulldozed in 1996. The only remnants are memories. For years, teens and young adults trespassed into the old hospital upon hearing tales of patients being mistreated and abused, because it goes along with the haunted theme that we have with every single asylum across the world. Have the mournful souls that died at Central State remained at the only home most of them ever knew, filled with pain and anguish and death just as they were in life. Quite a facility. Beautiful, but then we have this account of all these terrifying things happening there. Well, you know, we, we didn't find out that the United States conducted experiments on human beings against their will, right? We, we didn't thoroughly account for that. That's not known and admitted to by the mainstream, is it? Yes, it is. Well, let's take a look at Iowa since we want to go to the bottom of that Cherokee facility. I mean, this was just Louisville and Kentucky. Maybe this was just one facility that had something like this happen at it. It, it was an isolated incident, right? 
Well, let's look at this little account uh, for all these facilities in Iowa. And there's five that they point out. And the first one they talk about is the Poor Farm, the Johnson County Poor Farm, built in 1855. And really what they say is that hard work and fresh air. So they put people to work. Often the very poorest citizens were also residents of these establishments. And so they lived at county poor farms and did farm chores as they were able. So in other words, it gives you the impression that there was a shortage of labor and people who didn't agree with what was going on were sent there to work. And then you get uh, some of the other facilities in Iowa. Look at this one, Independent State Hospital. Remember, this is a state with a minimal population that during the Civil War sent over 10% of its entire population to fight in the U.S. Civil War, or the War of the Rebellion as they call it. And here you go, you get this theme, a growing need for mental health facilities in Iowa after the Civil War caused the Iowa legislature to put aside money to build an additional hospital for the insane. The only facility in the state was in Mount Pleasant at the time, and it was overcrowded. Of course it was. Independent State Hospital opened in 1873. <laughs> what a beauty that is. Wow. In the middle of Iowa in 1873. As they were building the Iowa State Capitol, no less. What a surprise. Does this story get worse? Clarenda was the home of Iowa's third insane asylum. It opened in 1888 and accepted only male patients because the female wing wasn't complete. The 500,000 square foot building has a gothic facade that retains the original architectural integrity. And they still use it today. And there you can see it. Wow. Ah, yes, the Cherokee Mental Health Institute, the one we already took a look at. Look at, there's that amazing, beautiful tower. Maybe it wasn't so optional after all. When the state of Iowa needed a fourth asylum to relieve overcrowding in the other facilities, the town of Cherokee lobbied diligently for this building. The leg legis legislature granted their wish and the hospital opened in 1902. In the first two weeks it was open, over 500 patients arrived by train. At its peak, there were more than 1,000 patients living there. We have to wonder, is that all that was living there given that immense amount of space? This was a working farm and residents helped to produce the food they needed. Chickens, horses, cattle, pigs, sheep, and a large garden sustain itself. So we see this recurring theme that these facilities were isolated. They were off the grid. And it's the same story for asylums across the United States and whatever they called them, whether they were asylums for the mentally ill, asylums for soldiers, asylums for children. We had asylums for everything, it seems. What was really going on at these asylums? What was really the intention behind the Kirkbride plan? Those are questions we have to ask. So what can we say in conclusion about the Kirkbride plan? Well, let's recount the facts. It's a fact that many of these buildings are still standing today. Therefore, you can visit them and you can verify their existence. And you'd be surprised at how many there really are. The documented facilities from the Kirkbride plan do not even begin to scratch the surface of the number of facilities and their widespread use from the 19th through the 20th century. It is true that in the mid to the late 20th century, it seems as though the political wind shifted and many of the facilities were shut down. And the United States completed its transition from interring people in mental asylums to prisons which is where many people find themselves today. Those are all facts. It's also a fact that there is a very colored history with many of the facilities of the Kirkbride plan. They were not so benign and benevolent as their intention was. There are many reports and accounts of the patients suffering. And then we also have to wonder, were these internment camps blended over to extermination camps? Because the line from internment camp to extermination camp is non-existent at best. How many people were really interred in these locations? How many people died there and how many people suffered there? Those are important questions. But finally, what do I think are the theorized goals of the actual Kirkbride plan? What were the real goals of it? Since the last thing they wanted to do was help people or have people who were actually ill be there. And our mainstream even admits this, that many people were in these facilities who were not mentally ill at all. The first goal, under the actual goals of the Kirkbride plan, was to ensure the population adhered to the reset, that people accepted the society, history, culture, and authority, that their beliefs were controlled, 
This was not simple authoritarianism. This was totalitarianism. The population had to accept it. And I speculated in an earlier video that there were enclaves, there were pockets of survivors from the reset that were still out and spread across the land. They either had to be exterminated or they had to be confined. Another goal would be to utilize and explain the presence of isolated large facilities that remained after the reset. You have all these incredible facilities that are out in the middle of nowhere. How exactly do you explain it? And if you can't explain it, how difficult would it be to tear them down? And we know for a fact that there are many large facilities, such as the City Hall in Philadelphia, that they just simply couldn't tear down because they lacked the resources to tear down the buildings. So this would be a good way that you could solve both problems. You can now utilize these facilities, and since they're already isolated, it's a place where you can send people away from the main population. And that's goal three, function as an internment camp far away from populated areas. Any survivors you find that you don't kill, and any people who resist accepting the new order can be sent to these facilities. And finally, and most insidiously. You can experiment with methods of individual and group control and influencing the mind. And it seems that's exactly what happened at these facilities. It's also a fact that we know that the United States conducted experiments on human beings against their will. That is well documented. And there are many stories that come with these facilities. Mental asylums do not have good connotations with them. And you have to ask yourself why. Now, is this all a dark tale that's told to make us feel down? No. The most important thing is that we have awareness. If we have awareness of what happened and what could happen, then we can preclude it from happening in the future. We understand the true past so we can live well in the present and we can build a better future. And that is the real goal of these explorations. Well, thank you for joining me. As always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe.